Kia ora guys, welcome back to the Black Jersey. My name's Max, I'm the host of this channel and we're about to hit 6,000 subscribers so make sure you flick that subscribe button and uh, join my viewership. Thank you so much to my patrons as per usual for your ongoing support. Today's video is going to be about France's victory against Scotland. <laughs> Scotland dominated the crap out of the territory, they dominated um, a few more stats, they looked like um, a bit more of a cohesive team with a bit more expansive rugby, whereas France France were playing a bit more like South Africa than the usual expensive rugby we see from them. So today's deep dive is going to be centered around how France fended off the we come back Scotland started to get going in the second half to make up for their lack of points in the first half. Without further ado, let's get into the analysis of the first half. After defeat to Ireland, an angry France side put so much energy into dominating up front that you'd think the front row were looking to get rewarded with 10 kgs worth of snails for their dinner. Marchand throws a perfect lineup before he detaches from the mall and runs down the 12 channel at pace. Now let's watch here as he deliberately charges at Hamish Watson to ensure Scotland's don't have any loose forwards to get over the ball and win the turnover. As George Turner is on Watson's outside, he is to go back around to enter the breakdown, forcing Finn Russell in as a jackal option. With Gail Fiku used as a makeshift clean-out option, Turner is removed from the breakdown and France's backline shift to the open side to allow a carry from Gregory Aldrit. As we can see during the cleanout for this ruck as well, Moe Fana is also being used as a cleanout option like how Fiku was at the previous phase. He joins the pot of Aldrit and Olivon so that Dupont will have more forwards to pass to on 3 minutes 26 seconds. In the third phase, Hawa stands in front of Matt Fagerson so that Scotland's wider defence channels are targeted by a two-man pot of Willemse and Marchand while this also allows for Muhammad Hawass to be in a decent clean-out position once the ruck forms. Because France continue to target the wider channels of Scotland's ruck defence, the Scots always have to continue spreading out. The fact that they can't bunch together as tightly forces them to surrender the front foot ball to France. France gain metres off every single carry aside from Penos after Willems goes to ground. After seven phases, Scotland are penalised for being offside, and instead of kicking the ball away for the sake of kicking it, like how Finn Russell would, France hold onto the ball and Moe Fana sprints at Tui Pelotu being very close to scoring. Before we show the next ruck formation though, we notice that both teams have a significant amount of players packed into France's right hand side of the pitch. Tui Pelotu and Stain are the only Scottish players on their sides of the posts, with the sudden switch to the open side guaranteeing France to score at the next phase. While France are all drifting to the open side, Scotland's closest defenders to Tui Pelotu's inside have to remain on this shoulder to avoid giving France the space for an offload. Knowing the threat of Anton Dupont, Richie Gray guards the fringes of the ruck as the ball is ready to be passed, while Watson also remains focused on this gap. Gilchrist and Stain, however, fail to spread out wide. Intermax spots this mistake and punishes them big time, crossing the try line after a missed tackle by Stain, ending a perfectly designed pre planned move from the coaches. Anyway, guys, let's get the explanation of the two red cards over and done with. For most of this match it was 14 on 14 with Grant Gilchrist going off in the 6th minute and Mohamed Hawass going off in the 10th minute. Both of them were correctly given, some people are grumpy at how they were handled, but I'm not too grumpy as long as the final decision is correct, I'm not fussed. As we can see, Gilchrist's left arm is indeed wrapping around Anthony Gelanche, but his right arm isn't. It's at his side with the forearm facing Gelanche's torso, while we can clearly see his shoulder connect to Gelanche's nose. Direct contact to the head with force is the clear case over here, and it's always going to be a red. While most most of my fellow Kiwis will be up in arms about the ref ruining the game, going back to sleep at this point. Um, I keep watching the game and yes there's another red card. France of themselves fielded a walking red. As we can see with the lineout, Mohamed Hawass is being incredibly lazy and taking too much time to get back in the mall, while Ben White has entered the boss around the forwards. After Stain and Ritchie both fall out of the mall, White can finally receive the ball as it goes to ground. Hawass is the fringe guard of what is now a ruck, and White looks to pass to Russell on the outside. Hawass, however, has no self-control and proves himself to be a walking red card as he charges straight at White's head even though he is yet to take the ball off the ground. Hawass's head 
clearly clashes with White's. This is also direct contact to the head with force, with Hawass clearly meeting the criteria for getting sent off the field, and yet as we can see over here, he argues with the ref and takes no responsibility for another player's safety in the same way he took no responsibility for the car and tobacco he was found stealing in 2014 and then convicted for in 2022. Anyway guys, let's get back to the positive stuff, let's continue to analyse the first half and discuss this try to Ethan Dumortier. France's second try of the match comes in the 8th minute with Anton Dupont throwing one of the all-time great passes out wide with not a single Scottish player on the left of the posts. Olivon shows amazing mobility to get the ball out to Fiku who unleashes Intermac. Intermac and Dumortier are found on a 2 on 2 but with Russell so much further behind Tui Pilotu, Tui Pilotu is forced to hold his position before he goes in on Intermac. Intermac suckers him in to put Dumortier past Russell and there we go, France are already in the double digits. After Scotland spend a fair period of time inside the French half, France are away for a third try. White is at the ruck with both teams down to 14 now as Hogg has been used as a clean out option alongside Turner. Due to Scotland's quick ruck speed, Willems and Olivon as we can see know not to compete at the breakdown due to the risk of a penalty because they've correctly chosen not to enter a losing game. Scotland now have fewer players on the deck than France do. White goes out wide to Russell on the blind side while we can see a 3 on 3 as we freeze frame. As the ball is mid-air we can see that Russell, Tui Pilotu, Jones and Stain are all marked. As every Scottish player is being marked by the opposite number and there is no ruck clearance option out wide for Scotland, Russell made a bad decision to start up an attack in this zone of the pitch. Because Dumortier is in a reasonable position to tackle Stain with his body tilted towards the touchline, Ramos has the ability to have a go at an intercept. Though he is out of frame right now, Romain Intermac is also in the pocket where the fullback normally stands, so Ramos has a second defender available in behind his intercept fail. With Dumortier in as a support option, Tomar Ramos, he feels that the intercept is on and he makes a total mockery of Finn Russell's game management. This is especially as when we freeze frame to show Tomar Ramos between the 10 meter line and halfway line, Scotland clearly have the numbers out wide at the previous phase. While there does seem to be a bit of a cult of people that are starting up who think I know nothing about rugby because I don't rate Finn Russell's game management, um, I do think this is an intercept that never should have happened. We'll find through looking at the halftime stats though that the scoreline really doesn't reflect how well Scotland have done with ball in hand for most of it, so in the 25th minute we finally see a course correction on the scoreline. Scotland gain forward momentum with a powerful maul and after it goes to ground we see Tui Pilotu call for the ball as France have few numbers to guard the fringes around the ruck. Tui Pilotu however turns out to be a decoy runner stepping in front of Intermac to give a 2 on 3 for Scotland. Russell stands in at the second receiver channel with Jones outside him and Stain on the wing. Russell initially looks to pass out wide to Stain as Dumortier is far too wide and out of frame right now. As Dumortier comes into the frame though, Jones runs onto Russell's pass and Scotland puts some deserved points on the board. As Charles Olivon crosses the try line for France, after the ref has blown the halftime whistle, um, the halftime score is 22 to 7 for France, thanks to a Tomar Ramos penalty in the 35th minute. Let's have a look at the halftime stats and see what they can tell us about the team's tactics. What we're seeing right now is a pretty telling case of each team. Um, Scotland 55% possession to 45 for France, with 59% territory to 41 for France. Scotland are clearly getting the most of the ball, but it's always about what you do with the ball that matters. Um, as we can see, France have still been able to run more meters, beat more defenders, and make more clean breaks, as they are um, running the cutter off nine and with the forwards a little bit more. Because they're dominating up front with the forwards, where rather um, they are just getting a bit more of the front football when they do have possession. Um, France two offloads, um, Scotland three turnovers winning that over there. Um, the reason France have to play so tight is because Scotland 
are winning more turnovers and um, because of the jackal threat Scotland just have everywhere around the pitch um, that is just what France have to do they have to take a South African approach to this game and break the Scots down um, quite interesting though France have a far higher tackle percentage than Scotland who are at just 77% um, I don't think we want to look too much into the tackle percentage though as um, Scotland do tend to use a cover defence strategy plus um, they've made far fewer tackles with France. France have completed 77. Scotland have completed 50. Um, the goal kick success, I'm not too worried about that either due to the low numbers. Um, the ruck success though, very interestingly, Scotland are ahead at 98%. France are on 94%. Because France are conceding those turnovers, that's why the rucks aren't as high. Um, France just have to have such tight pods to counteract the Scotland strategy that I really wish I could find footage of. The lineouts, I won't uh, look too much into them as well, just one lost lineout for Scotland and I won't look at the scrum too much though. Something worrying though is that France have conceded five penalties inside their own half. Um, had Scotland taken four of these penalties, um, it would be 22 to 19, a far closer score margin at half time. So I do think the um, penalties France are giving away inside their own half is a real missed opportunity for Scotland. Let's get into the footage from the second half and see what we can dissect with our scalpels in that period of the game. I'm not going to lie guys, after seeing all this territory and domination up front for Scotland not result in points on the board, I started to get behind them and support them in the second half and Scotland fans finally got their wish in the 48th minute with a second try to Hugh Jones. We all know Scotland can play expansive rugby and we see it now with Richie Gray going out the back to Russell. Scotland's four strike runners are in a diamond shape with Schumann at the head of the pod, Richie another single man pod out wide while the back line are tucked in behind these two forwards. Hugh Jones, who was about 15 metres or so directly behind Skuman, receives a massive pass while Skuman removes defenders from France's line with a wee decoy line of his own. Richie doesn't seem to be moving too quickly, but appears to have a head start so that he can clean the ruck out wide, as any single player pod should do. Jones beats three defenders before going to ground five metres out, but Richie, however, doesn't arrive at the break down other backs do. Skuman is the first carrier inside the Scotland 22, with Gray and Ritchie clearly obeying a pre-planned game plan, which had a direction for Skuman to be available straight after the ruck around Jones. With Falatia not rolling away for France, Scotland do the right thing with their advantage this time. With Johnny Gray making some noise about a carry, Willemza and co look a little bit surprised as White passes out to Tui Pilotu. Tui Pilotu, who I think is the most improved player of the tournament, passes Passes over to Hugh Jones, his Glasgow teammate, and he makes a very nice dummy to send him over to score. Aside from the second penalty goal that we can see from Ramos over here, the second half truly feels like it's got a Scottish presence as they continue to dominate the territory in the breakdown. While Finn Russell has another brain explosion that we can see over here, he definitely makes up for it with a try shortly after. Um, I don't think this try needs too much analysis, it's just a nice case of the 9 and 10 having a great share of combined playing experience and communicating well with a player they know outside them to put points on the board after taking an opportunity created by real strength in the scrum. Scotland continue to dominate the breakdown in the second half and I was at the edge of my seat expecting them to nail a comeback, but France's 6-2 bench split was unfortunately more effective than Scotland's. Machu Jalabir had a nice cameo off the bench and as we can see he's got an excellent winning mentality for the backup team. He looks at the score margin as the ref signals for the penalty and realises that France will need to get a good points differential to win the Six Nations. Jalabert talks to the rest of the players in the team's spine and he looks to kick to touch to give his team a positive points differential. While we're all expecting the lineout, including Scotland, this kick to touch doesn't happen and Scotland suddenly need to rush up after a quick tap. Francois Crow makes a massive carry with Rita Wardy up next. With France now on the front foot, Dupont deliberately targets the area of the previous ruck where Scotland's defence is the least organised. With the numbers out wide, Fiku draws in price before smashing Johnny Gray to score the winning try, ending Scotland's hopes of a grand slam. With a final score of 32-21, to France 
France do remain fourth on the table due to having just a um, point differential of plus three, whereas Scotland have a bit more of a points differential. Scotland had an even better share of territory in the second half, and uh, man, this is really disappointing to see. Um, I don't think we'll go over the um, running stats and the ruck stats too much as we do continue to see Scotland dominate the breakdown with six turnovers to three. The tackle percentage for Scotland is 82% to France's 87%. Um, France's unstructured rugby made it very hard for Scotland to defend close to the ruck um, and close to the try line. As we can see with the tries, France did end up scoring. Um, I won't look at the goal kicking either. The ruck success though comes a little bit down for Scotland with France just pelting their bodies at them much more harsher and is making it far more difficult for Scotland to succeed in this facet of the game with front football in the last 10 minutes. Um, line out success. Scotland lose two, France lose one. I don't think we can go over that. But the scrum, this is where France really put in the dirty work and uh, really made Scotland work hard to do their best. With such a dominant scrum, France were just able to run far harder off the base of it with more front football. And you know, guys, when I said four penalties inside France's own half should have been taken um, in the first half, well, now that we look at the end of the game, Scotland conceded nine penalties in total with 10 for France. Eight inside France's own half. France are going to need to work on that discipline. Had Scotland taken those opportunities to take those four penalties, they would have won this game by 33 to 32, a very close margin over there that we can mention. Um, Jamie Ritchie as a new captain perhaps hasn't learned the um, difference that taking the three can make just yet, but he's a very good player and I respect him. I believe he will um, learn that in time for the World Cup. Um, the two red cards also I don't think had too much of an impact on the game. Um, all it really did was create a bit more of space on the pitch that both teams used to play um, a bit more expansive rugby when it did indeed come to scoring the tries. Um, a few attacking opportunities did go astray but that happens in all test matches. There were a few holdups that I couldn't show footage of but it's okay. Um, both teams I do think are heading in the right track. France just like how Ireland indeed are, they are holding stuff back for the World Cup. They've learned um, this winning streak back in 2022. They've learned to play all this expansive rugby. Now what they've been trying to do in this current season is learn how to dominate up front and win ugly. Scotland, on the other hand, um, it is going to be tough for them to go forward, but it does show they have the combined playing experience and a settled squad that they can continue to build on. I'm not going to write their chance of a World Cup off just yet. Thank you once again to all my patrons. Thank you to everyone for watching this video and I will see you on the next one, okay? Thank you guys so much from Max.